what is median arcuate ligament syndrome? By the end of this video, you'll not only know that, but also how MALS is related to postural orthostatic tachycardia syndrome and hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. If you're a neurodivergent or a spoonie and are looking to master yourself and your time in a compassionate way, this is the place for you to be. Subscribe to my channel and hit the bell to be notified whenever I post a new video. I have MALS, POTS, and EDS, so let's dive in, shall we? By the way, I've listed all of my research sources in the description box below. So the first thing we need to understand, and I've got my notes here because this is not going to work in a teleprompter situation, as I have already found out. We need to understand what the median arcuate ligament itself is. It's something that connects the left and right sides of the diaphragm, and it is a piece of connective tissue, which is very relevant for those of us with connective tissue disorders like EDS. The ligament is formed at the base of the diaphragm where the left and right diaphragmatic crura join near the 12th thoracic vertebra. This fibrous arch forms the anterior aspect of the aortic hiatus. And there are two really important pieces of biology around there. And one of them is the celiac artery and the other is the celiac plexus. The celiac artery is one of the largest arteries in the body and it supplies blood to most of the gut. The celiac plexus is the largest autonomic nerve in the body. It's part of the sympathetic nervous system, which is responsible for the fight or flight response. It innervates most of the digestive tract, and this can not only cause pain, but possibly also the autonomic phenomenon often associated with MALS, and we're going to get to symptoms in a little bit. Simply stimulating the celiac ganglion activates the sympathetic nervous system. So a lot of us in this space know, for example, the vagus nerve in our neck is something that we can attempt to superficially stimulate in order to um, activate the rest and digest response in our body. The, the celiac plexus is the, the, the opposite of that. It's the fight or flight response. And we can also get in MALS sympathetic over discharge because of overstimulating the celiac plexus. So now that we understand what the median arcuate ligament is, we can talk about the syndrome. So median arcuate ligament syndrome is where the median arcuate ligament encroaches on the celiac artery and the celiac ganglia. It's a very rare condition, and there are a couple of ways mechanically that encroachment can happen. Either the ligament itself is lower than it should be, or the celiac artery and ganglia are higher. <laughs> Either way, they have come to meet each other in a compressed fashion that is no bueno. Another thing that's important to keep in mind is that because the median arcuate ligament is part of what attaches both sides of the diaphragm, this ligament also moves with the movement of our diaphragm. So when we take in a breath and our diaphragm descends, the ligament descends. When we exhale and our diaphragm moves upward, the ligament moves upward. And often it is the exhalation that increases the compression of the artery and the ganglia. One of the notes that I have here, a direct quote, due to individual variations of topographic relationships of the participating structures, a spectrum exists from slight compression to complete constriction of the celiac artery. There's also some microscopic pathology that can occur. So there can be fibrosis of the median arcuate ligament fibers, there can be an enlargement of the celiac nerve plexus after being compressed and basically aggravated over a long period of time. And there can also be a web of scar tissue within the wall of the celiac artery, again, because of this ongoing compression and aggravation. So what are the causes of median arcuate ligament syndrome? There are three basic categories. One is congenital. It's just how you're born. That's how your body was built. Um, it can also be developmental. So for example, with growth spurts, connective tissue disorders, and lordosis. I think mine was puberty onset. So for me, it was developmental. The other thing that can happen is just an alteration of anatomy, either from uh, abdominal or spinal surgery or abdominal trauma. So now let's talk about symptoms. I, the symptoms are awful. So first off, you get persistent abdominal symptoms, which can include pain after eating, epigastric pain or tenderness, 
early satiety, indigestion, nausea, vomiting, constipation, and or diarrhea. <laughs> Why not have both? Gastroparesis. It can cause weight loss and or low body weight because sometimes if someone is unable to eat from pain, they eat less, therefore they lose weight. But that isn't true for everyone. Uh, you do not have to be at a low weight to get diagnosed for MALS. I am not at a low weight, but I have MALS. And then you can also have autonomic symptoms from MALS because of how it affects the celiac plexus. So you can have pulse changes, aka your heartbeat. You can have blood pressure issues. Um, there's also something called a bruit, which is like a heart murmur. It's, it's what's happening in a heart murmur, but it's happening somewhere other than the heart. And it's essentially turbulent flow of blood through a narrowed blood vessel. And so that's what's happening when the celiac artery gets compressed. The blood makes a very particular sound going through that compressed artery, and that's called a bruit. And it's said that this epigastric bruit is heard in about 50% of MALS patients. So you don't have to have it in order to be diagnosed with MALS. Another thing is exercise intolerance. In addition to POTS and EDS being comorbidities, you can also have hyperadrenergic POTS be a comorbidity. I'm curious, before watching this video, had you ever heard of MALS before? Let me know in the comments below. So we've talked about what the median arcuate ligament is, what the syndrome is, and the symptoms. Now let's talk a little bit about how you go about diagnosing MALS. So usually there's a detailed history and physical exam, laboratory work to rule out other causes of gastrointestinal symptoms. You could have a abdominal color Doppler flow velocity test, uh, abdominal CT angiogram at end expiration. So um, like I mentioned earlier, because of how the diaphragm affects the median arcuate ligament, imaging may only show compression of the artery and ganglia at end exhalation. So that's having exhaled a full breath imposing there. This is, this was my experience because I have had all of these symptoms since I was 14 in the year 2000, if anyone wants to date me as an elder millennial. Um, I was diagnosed with other things or I was told it was in my head. I got diagnosed with IBS, I got diagnosed with gastroparesis, I got told it was all in my head, I got told I just didn't want to go to school. I loved school boogers. Anyways, <sighs> MALS is missed often because standard testing from GI doctors and cardiologists don't look at this ligament, artery, or ganglia. It's like this black hole <laughs> in the, the fields of specialty around abdominal pain. And it's really unfortunate and that's why it gets missed a lot. Doctors can think patients are faking it because gastrointestinal studies come up negative. That was me. And it's also possible to have incorrectly read imaging and also incorrectly done imaging. So for example, the exhalation in versus out is important when doing um, some imaging studies for MALS. Another thing, and this is for those who, uh, who have the POTS comorbidity like me, I was diagnosed with POTS in 2015 and I tried everything under the sun for standard treatment for POTS. And I have treatment resistant POTS. It wasn't until I learned about MALS that I'm like, oh, this might be why my POTS is treatment resistant because I have an actual mechanical issue where I have a ligament compressing a really important artery and a really important nerve. <laughs> One of the sources listed in the description below, I, I just love how he shared that the idea that POTS can have a lot of different root causes and we as a medical community can't get tired of looking for them. And I just really appreciated that and agree. The way my diagnosis worked, um, I started, it was a simple like ultrasound of the celiac plexus area, but that came up negative, but I was determined. I was so certain that I had MALS that I kept going and they ended up ordering a CT with contrast. Um, with end expiration. And the picture that came out of that was like textbook for MALS, according to my doctor. Then the next step after that, um, at least for me, was to do something I haven't mentioned yet, which is called a celiac plexus block. And that is where 
If you want to look it up, look it up. I don't want to trigger anyone because this was actually a very traumatic experience for me. I had two of them. The first one did not go well. Um, but it's where they stick long needles into your back on either side of your spine and numb the celiac plexus. And uh, if numbing it eliminates your pain, that is further confirmation that you have MALS. My second one uh, that was done, it went great. It went like it was supposed to. And I was shocked at how the pain was gone. It was all gone. <laughs> I could eat without pain. Um, and other things, but the numbing agent only lasted seven hours. So it's not a permanent treatment solution. It's more of like a, will surgery actually help? And that's what the celiac plexus block does. It helps determine whether or not surgery will help. So now let's talk about the treatment because I just started talking about the surgery. So treatment is a surgical release of the median arcuate ligament, which can not only resolve abdominal pain and digestive issues, but also autonomic dysfunction. More often than not, these days, it is done robotically, laparoscopically. Um, there are still some doctors who do it as a full open surgery, which is, you know, slicey, slicey open, open you like a book, do the surgery. But most specialists who do this surgery are doing it um, with a robot. So it's not even them inside you. It's a fancy robot that they're driving from a chair <laughs> next to you. <laughs> it's very fancy. It's also something you can look up if you want to see those things. I have linked a surgery video uh, below, but again, you know, it's a surgery. So don't watch that if you're not. Just save yourself. But what's cool about doing it robotically is it's a lot easier to recover from because the uh, incisions into your abdomen, I think there's maybe three of them, and they're really small. Um, and so you have a lot less to recover from um, and you start feeling better right away. I wanted to also include two studies um, that I found, both of them thanks to one of the surgeons I was trying to get the surgery with. And I have not had the surgery yet. My next video will be talking about that story. I'm going to have my editor put up the abstracts <laughs> from these two studies in some cards next to my head so you can read those. Uh, but they're also linked in the description box below. There you have it, a crash course in median arcuate ligament syndrome. If you're wanting to learn even more about this rare condition, I highly recommend checking out all of the sources I've listed in the description box below. There you'll also find links to my videos about POTS and EDS specifically. Meanwhile, if you're looking to master your time, get organized and offer yourself radical compassion as a neurodivergent spoonie, check out my signature course, The Action Navigator at the link in the description box below. If you liked this video, hit that like button and subscribe and be sure to share it with your friends. I'll be back soon with another video. See you then. Bye. I'm done. What? Make a stop. <laughs> Make thumbnail faces. All right. I don't know. Help me. Uh.